Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. Oh, Secretary thank you, Clinton. James. How is so nice to see you. It's lovely to see you any day, but particularly today where there is a lot to talk about. But first off, how are you? How's everyone in the family? Are you all okay? We are all okay, thank you, James. We are uh, sheltering next to each other. We've been uh, together since mid-March, and everybody's still alive <laughs> and able to, you know, get through the day. Our dogs are fine. Everything's going all right. Oh, good. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to hear that. Uh, now, let's talk about last night. So, it's the first <laughs> presidential debate between Vice President Biden, President Trump. Set the scene for me. What's debate night like in the Clinton household? Well, uh, for us last night, um, it was kind of a departure because we've done a lot of debates between the two of us. And, you know, we now were observers like the vast uh, majority of America who was watching. And it was nerve wracking, James. Uh, obviously, I am doing everything I can to help Joe Biden and Kamala Harris uh, to win. And I do have the unique experience of having shared a debate stage three times with Donald Trump. And I know that he will do or say anything, as we saw again last night. Uh, so I was watching, but every so often, you know, I'd kind of be cringing or I'd be going, oh, you know, a lot of, lot of dramatic uh, moments. And there were a couple of times I just had to get up and walk because, you know, it, it's very sad uh, to think that you know, we're having the most important election in maybe our history coming up. And uh, the president, one of the two candidates, uh, can't be bothered to answer the questions, to put forward any kind of agenda for the future. It's all insult and attack and braggadocio. And it just, it was sad, James. I mean, it was maddening and sad at the same time. And I just heard that the debate commission is going to, you know, have to change the rules because he just wouldn't stop interrupting. I thought Biden, you know, kept his cool, which is hard, uh, kept staring right at the American people into those cameras, into those living rooms, trying to say, here, what he'd do about COVID and about the economy and about climate change and everything else. So I thought on balance, you know, Joe did fine and Trump demonstrated how out of control uh, he is, and I, I just worry about what the next, you know, month is going to be like. We all of us are having those feelings, but uh, honestly, hearing you talk about it is, uh, is, I think, making certainly a lot of us feel much better. Stick around more with Secretary Clinton when we come back. Now, Secretary Clinton, you are the only person on Earth who's faced Trump one-on-one -on -one in a debate. Um, I think we all knew that things would get heated. When you were watching Joe Biden last night, what advice would you would you give him in those moments? Well, I actually did give advice uh, to the campaign, to his debate team. Um, it was some of the very same people that I worked with. And you cannot let Trump knock you off your game. Now, he will, as we saw last night, as we saw in my debates with him, try to dominate, uh, try to interrupt, try to control whatever the conversation is. Uh, and so you have to be really focused and, and very disciplined about, you know, not getting totally off uh, the, the reservation all the time because he'll attack you in the middle of your answering a question totally against the rules. And you want to continue answering your question, but you don't want to look like you're avoiding his. I thought Biden did a, a good job trying to keep his balance uh, in the face of that, you know, 90-minute onslaught. I mean, even Chris Wallace, as you know, is one of the toughest uh, newscasters, certainly no pushover. And, and he was, like, overwhelmed by the, you know, just fusillage of uh, insult and interruption that you heard from uh, Trump. In fact, you know, it looks like the debate commission is going to change the rules. I don't know whether Trump will abide by them but they're going to try to give the moderators, you know, more control. Maybe they'll, you know, have a kill switch on the mic. Maybe they'll have a, a button to push and the, the floor drops out. I don't know, but something. 
But then my worry with the kill switch, with knocking someone's microphone out, is that you will then have to knock out Joe Biden's microphone, which then gives Trump two minutes to, to basically just lie. And unless the moderator steps in and says, that isn't true, Mr. President, that, that is false. I would like that to be on the record, that what you just said was a lie. What it gives him is that he also then gets two minutes of absolute freedom to just... to just lie about it. Well, I knew he would lie. He's incapable of not lying. Uh, he has made his, uh, you know, his career on the basis of lies about his wealth. We now know uh, absolutely definitively uh, something that I said back in 2016. He's not as rich as he claims. He doesn't pay income tax and, you know, everything else we've learned. So lying is, is, is not just second, it's first nature to Donald Trump. Um, and what's so uh, regrettable is, you know, many millions of people tuned in. Now, you know, a lot of America's made up its mind, but there still truly are undecided people, not just about who they'll vote for, but whether they'll vote. And I think that if they were to watch that um, and, and just feel so alienated from, you know, the behavior on stage, you see it as an assault on our election. You see it as a, an assault on our democracy, even more than an assault on Joe Biden and on the moderator. Uh, it's got to be, you know, troubling and discouraging to many people who tuned in. So I, I don't know what the commission's going to come up with, James. I don't know what technique they're going to try. It really takes a very tough-minded moderator not to be overrun by Trump's uh, constant uh, bullying, because that's really what we saw last night. We saw a mean bully uh, who knows he's losing and is going to take everybody down with him if we let him. Uh, so I think that uh, the commission's going to have to be creative, and whoever the next moderator is is going to have to be really willing to enforce whatever the new rules are. I actually thought uh, Vice President Biden was at his most effective in the moments that he chose to, to speak directly to the American people when, when he said, it's not about my family, it's not about your family, it's about your family, and that's what it's about, right. and he doesn't care yes. about that. Um, yeah. And, and I thought, felt like that's when he was at his most effective. And I feel like if he, if he can stick to that, if he can stick to the right. notion that, that, that he is of the people, for the people, then his message has a, has a purity to it. I mean, you speak there uh, about, you know, his finances, his taxes, um, and then even now in his presidency, his, his lack of leadership in the, in the response to the COVID crisis there are so many things. I feel like weekly on this show, we, we are talking about endless times where he's come up short or he's lied. Why do you think that none of these revelations seem to sway his committed supporters? Well, I think that um, he has a hard core of support. Uh, it is now in the, you know, low 40% range. Uh, and these are people who, for a combination of reasons, James, are drawn to a style of leadership uh, that is bullying. Uh, it has everything to do with how they see the world and their place in it. Uh, they also feel like he's on their side when it comes to a lot of the cultural issues that, um, unfortunately, he has made very divisive. You know, one of the worst things last night was Trump basically refusing to denounce white supremacy and then giving uh, a, a big shout out to the Proud Boys, which is a, a gang of toughs uh, who beat up people because they disagree with them politically. Uh, and it's all too reminiscent of what authoritarian leaders have done in other countries. So when you know, Trump was asked to disown the Proud Boys, he basically said, oh, you know, yeah, stand back, but stand by. And according to the, you know, online media today, you know, the Proud Boys feel like that's a, you know, go signal from Trump. So there are segments of his base that are attracted to him and stay with him for a variety of reasons. But I believe what's happening and what the polls certainly suggest is that a lot of people, and particularly women, um, who have watched this presidency 
and particularly watched his failure of leadership around uh, the coronavirus are not buying it anymore. I mean, the reality show is no longer entertaining. It's uh, about to be canceled uh, in terms of, you know, their view uh, and their vote. And so part of what Biden is doing is reassuring people who, you know, maybe voted for him, maybe voted third party, maybe didn't vote, uh, that they can come together in this election and not only defeat Donald Trump, get back to leadership that cares about them and their families and doesn't seek to divide us the way that Trump does. And someone tweeted last night, they tweeted that, uh, that they were positive. You would have wanted to say, will you shut up, man, to Trump in 2016? And you responded <laughs> with, you have no idea. <laughs> did you? Is, is that true? Did, did you watch it thinking, oh, I wish I just told him to shut up? Oh, my gosh. You know, there are a lot of things I wished... I could have said or should have said. <laughs> uh, but for a lot of reasons, uh, mostly because I actually think, you know, it would be much harder for a woman to get away with that. I think Joe got some real credit for basically saying what a lot of people wanted to say to Trump. But I think it is much more difficult, uh, at least at this point in our, in our political history, for a woman to say some of the things that I certainly thought. <laughs> now, the vice presidential nominee, Kamala Harris, she's going to debate next week with Vice President Pence. When I see Mike Pence, I sort of think, I don't even know if he likes Donald Trump. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, deep down, deep, deep down, I don't know if he does. I sort of... You imagine the two of them having a conversation, you think, what can you possibly be talking about? <laughs> like... You know, one one is a man who is in who is a you know says that he is a deeply religious Christian man, and the other man won't condemn white supremacy. Normally, those two don't have breakfast together. Well, you know, you've heard of uh, people who make a deal with the devil, haven't you? Um, <laughs> people who use uh, you know someone. Uh, that they may not uh, respect or admire, but who they believe is going to further their agenda. And uh, Mike Pence is part of a, you know, a very conservative yeah. uh, part of the Republican Party uh, that has a, a very uh, specific cultural agenda. And I think they're willing to put up with a lot of what we would all consider unacceptable, insulting behavior uh, for Trump to just keep giving them what they want. I, I, I think that's the best explanation. Does it worry you? It worries me, because when, when Trump talks about a peaceful transfer of power, uh, uh, you know, should the election not go his way, and he says, well, we'll just have to wait and see and those things, do you worry that it's going to take members of that Republican Party, it's going to take the... the the Mitch McConnells and the Mike Pences and the Ted Cruz's and these, these characters that we've got to know over the past few year, four years and you've known for a lot longer. Do you worry, do you look at that group of people and think, who in there has the backbone and the gumption to say, President Trump, it's over, we, we have to go and this is how you do it? I don't think any of them would do that, James. Um, I think that they've all sold their souls uh, and given away their backbones uh, to... Uh, support Trump to enable him. Uh, they don't speak out uh, when he uh, does uh, things to undermine our institutions, our democracy, the rule of law. I think this election really comes down to an overwhelming turnout of voters uh, who send as clear a message as has ever been sent that Donald Trump must go. We need to be sure that we have a big turnout, particularly in the so-called swing states. Uh, Joe needs to win, obviously, not only the popular vote by many millions, but also the Electoral College, so that there is no place to turn, no place to hide uh, by his Republican enablers, because I do not have any confidence uh, that the ones who have stuck with him um, would turn against him. I, I admire the people who have stood up against him from time to time, uh, but it's been uh, far and few between. And I 
I regret that. I mean, I think we need a good, robust political debate, and that means we need a, a good, you know, solid uh, Republican Party that has people uh, that used to be there, uh, the John McCain's, uh, the yeah. Margaret Chase Smith's, the Howard Baker's. You know, when uh, Richard Nixon was um, impeached by a vote in the committee of the House of Representatives back in the summer of 1974, uh, some very distinguished Republican senators, Barry Goldwater and Howard Baker, people like that, went to the White House and told the president that he needed to go for the good of the country. I, I can't imagine um, that these others who are there now um, are going to grow the backbone necessary uh, to do that. I'd love to be proven wrong, but the surest way to uh, protect our election and guarantee the outcome that means that we do have a new president is an overwhelming vote. And that's what I'm urging everybody to please do, regardless of you know, who you've ever voted for before. Uh, this, this vote may be the most important you will ever cast. We're going to go to break shortly, but let me ask you this. If, let's say, Joe Biden is elected president of the United States and he and Kamala Harris, uh, they give you a call and say, would you have any interest in joining this cabinet? What would you say? Well, you know, I've been down this road and, and I told Barack Obama no twice before saying yes. Um, and I did it at the end because I think that if a newly elected president um, asks you to serve, if you at all can serve, you should. And I feel particularly strongly uh, about that for, you know, the next generation of public officials and, and decision makers who are out there waiting to help repair the damage uh, to our country. So, um, you know, I, that, that bridge will be crossed if it ever uh, comes up. But I urge everyone else to uh, serve if you are asked, because Joe and Kamala are going to need a lot of help to fix what Donald Trump has broken. It would make for some good new bookings on your podcast if you were really in <laughs> the room where it happened. Uh, we're going to talk about that podcast and so much more when we come back. Stick around.